everyone. I'm attorney Donna DiMaggio Berger, and this is Take It to the Board, where we speak condo and HOA. Today is a special episode of Take It to the Board. We are going to be talking about mask mandates in community associations. Our conversation today is going to be shorter than a typical episode, but just as information-packed. I have as my guest my partner, David Ramsey. David serves as the chair of Becker's New Jersey Community Association Practice Group. He has represented community associations in New Jersey for over 35 years. He has served in a number of leadership roles with the Community Associations Institute, or CAI, and is a fellow member of the College of Community Association Lawyers. David, welcome to Take It to the Board. Thank you, Donna. I'm really looking forward to this. I am too. So David, let's get started. The governor in your state, Phil Murphy, has taken a very different approach than Governor DeSantis in my state has. Has the messaging on masks been consistent from the beginning of the pandemic until today in your state? Well, it's probably been a little more consistent than it has been in in Florida, but I wouldn't say it's been absolutely consistent. Now, I think everybody knows that at the very beginning, New York, New Jersey, our area was the most affected. We were the hot spot. So immediately we had stay at home orders. We had masking requirements, couldn't go into any grocery store, pharmacy, et cetera, without a mask by law. I mean, that was that was uh, imposed by Governor Murphy's executive orders. That stayed pretty much the same until late April, early May of this year when Governor Murphy lifted the requirement for masks in uh, indoor spaces. Of course, nobody quite anticipated the severity of the Delta variant at that point. As we all know, that has become a significant impact. I know particularly in Florida, but all over the country. And although the governor has not reinstituted mandatory mask wearing uh, in, in interior spaces, the CDC has recommended that. And I would not be surprised if sometime in the near future uh, we see that change. Yeah, I agree. Now, in Florida, we I imagine that your community is like mine, David. They were looking for some support to back up their decisions, you know, decisions to close the gym or the clubhouse or the pool or to require people to mask up. These are not terribly popular decisions. So it's always helpful when they get that inevitable pushback to say, well, we kind of have to do this because the governor's making us or the county's making us do that. In the absence of that, though, where are, you know, what are boards in in your area doing, and I'll tell you what they're doing in mine. A lot of them, once Governor DeSantis kind of said, you know, there's no longer a state of emergency in effect down here in Florida with regard to COVID. And not only that, there's been some fairly aggressive policies down here in terms of not allowing businesses or local government or, or, or agencies to impose mask mandates or proof of vaccination. We now have a lot of boards who mistakenly think that, well, we can't do anything. Our hands are tied. What's the situation in, in New York, New Jersey? I think it's somewhat similar, but there's a little more circumspection by boards in New Jersey about being willing to require masks because you don't have the negative reaction to them that you do maybe in the South in general. So what happened in our state is in May, just before, now we have a very short pool season compared to yours, so we generally run from Memorial Day to Labor Day. Uh, They changed the Department of Health rules so that it no longer became necessary for vaccinated people to wear masks while at the pool, but you were to encourage unvaccinated people. Well, of course, that doesn't make a lot of sense, frankly, because how do you know who's vaccinated and who's unvaccinated unless you've limited access to only vaccinated people. And we do have some associations who have done that, particularly age-restricted communities, but even some others with some exceptions for kids under 12 who can't be vaccinated. I will tell you that with the new CDC guidance that came out just the other day, I'm now being asked, well, should, even though the state has not reimposed the requirement for masks, should we reimpose that requirement. And I have advised uh, my clients that it would be safer and more prudent to follow the CDC requirements. And the state may follow, it may not follow, but you would be better off doing that. 
You know, even the public health guidance on this issue has become so highly politicized. And I bring this up in the context of uh, in Florida, we have a COVID uh, liability shield law, which protects associations, basically says, you know, it requires a judge to throw out a case if he or she finds that the property owner, in this case, an association engaged in reasonable COVID transmission prevention measures. And normally those track whatever the public health guidance is. Now, if you go to the Florida Department of Health website, They don't say anything about masks. They're talking about vaccination, but they've kind of backed off. And I imagine this is true in a number of states throughout the U.S. that the local uh, Surgeon General and the local Department of Health, for whatever reason, is not delving into masking. But now we do have the CDC saying, hey, guess what? If you're indoors, you should mask up, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated. And that's the conversation I've had, David, with my clients is, We can't point to any public health uh, officials that are saying it's mask free for everyone, whether they're silent or not. Nobody is saying you can affirmatively do that and safely go mask free indoors. You know, we did get a law passed in. It was effective as of July 1 of this year. And it was a real uphill battle because New Jersey is very hostile to immunity laws. But we were able to tailor it to be very specific to community associations and only to community associations. And we, through a huge letter writing campaign uh, and emailing campaign in New Jersey, we were able to get it passed. Now, the governor had to be willing to sign off on it. And the only way the governor would sign off on it is if it had an exclusion for any willful, wanton, or gross negligence. And we've said to our clients, look, you don't want to throw away this immunity. So what's willful negligence? Well, willful negligence is whatever a jury or a judge decides it is in a particular case. There's no statutory definition of willful negligence. So if you're not acting as prudently as possible, if you're not following the highest standards of care, you may be throwing that away. And, you know, as we've all told our clients repeatedly, you have no insurance for this. And uh, you have a significant issue if you don't act extremely prudently. And I think that's helped actually to convince our clients they need to, even though the state's Department of Health is simply recommendations at this point with regard to masking, as opposed to mandatory. So we're pretty good. So I've found that I've had a lot of residents in these communities that have engaged in some mental acrobatics, David, in terms of trying to prove that, you know, Mrs. Smith got COVID in the indoor gym because we, you know, we didn't require masks. So they're engaging in this kind of analysis. And just to your point, my response is, look, you have to, if if I'm a plaintiff's attorney and I'm bringing a claim for a COVID-related illness, you know, either personal injury or wrongful death, I'm going to want to prove that that you were negligent and you did not provide a standard of due care in your area in light of public health guidance. And particularly down here in Florida, we have now become the hotspot for the Delta variant. Yeah. I think uh, Florida associations, particularly with as many uh, housing for older persons communities we have down here, that they have to be particularly mindful of the standard of care they are enforcing right now. As I said, many of them, you know, when the governor took the steps he took, they said, okay, I guess the pandemic's over. It's back to normal. So they opened everything up, no more masks. And, and I get it. You know, they want to make they want to make their, their people happy. Here's the thing, though. The members who are saying to them, you know, we don't like the masks. We don't want to have to do this. Those people don't owe a fiduciary duty to anyone, but the board members do. So can you speak to that a little bit? Because it's very hard to try to explain to some volunteer board members that because they have accepted service on the board, they are in a different position than their neighbor who is not sitting on the board. Well, you stated it very well, Donna, and and we have that same conversation with our clients. I'll just give you one anecdotal story about that. Uh, We represent a number of uh, age-restricted communities. Uh, Some of them are pretty large, a couple thousand units, a lot of residents, and there's a certain political undertone in some of these communities with people who are totally anti-mask, anti-vax, and we've literally had people a picket and protest at the clubhouse because they want the clubhouse open with no restrictions whatsoever. Luckily, the boards in those areas have pretty much stuck to their guns. It's a relatively small group who says, damn the torpedoes, 
full steam ahead. I think that boards, we have the same conversation. We say, you're in a different position. You can't even do what you think for yourself is necessarily an acceptable risk because you're representing other people's money and property, and you have to do what is the most prudent thing in that situation. And and they pretty much listen to that. I'm glad to hear that. Look, serving on a board was a thankless proposition before the pandemic. Can you imagine being a, a newcomer to the board? Your first year was 2020, and this is what you get hit with. But again, in a multifamily building, I, I think the stakes are higher, David, because you can't blink yourself out of your unit and you're suddenly in your car. You have to traverse the corridors, the elevator, yeah. the lobby. Yeah. It really is an extension of your home. And look, we do have people who are more vulnerable to this delta. Delta variant, and I think boards just have to be mindful. You're not going to make ev- everybody happy. That was the, that was the case before this pandemic hit. It's certainly the case now. But I want to ask you: When did our boards and our residents suddenly forget that boards have had rulemaking authority? Long before this pandemic hit, they'll have it well after. And I use this example with some of my clients, David, which is um, you may have somebody who wants the, the pool open 24 hours a day. This may be somebody who likes to swim. They may want to swim at one in the morning. That doesn't mean you have your pool open at one in the morning because 10% of your population thinks it's a good idea. Wards have had the ability to pass reasonable rules regarding the common areas. In Florida, we've got well-established case law on this issue. I'm sure you do in in New York and New Jersey. All we're ever hearing is, well, the government's not requiring this. Okay, well, the government never required you to close your pool at dusk. Your board required you to close your pool at dusk. You know, there's so much misinformation out there. I mean, we heard even last year, when it was permissible to open your pools and New Jersey was still mired in significant infections and hospitalizations, et cetera. And the governor issues an order that says you can subject to pretty burdensome requirement. You know, the owners would read the press reports and they would say, the governor said you must open your pool. And then, you know, board members who really don't know any better would say, well, is that, are we required to open the pool? And I'd say, well, no, of course not. You're, you're a private entity. You have to determine whether this is a good thing to do or not. And in New Jersey, at least, well over 80% of community association pools did not open last year. As I said, I think intelligently so, despite the fact that even last year we had people who were clamoring uh, for pools to be open and then they started asking for money back and, you know, all that all that sort of stuff. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Just to go back, if I may, for a moment, Donna, to the people who, you know, as you say, go through mental gymnastics about nobody could ever prove it. I, I have a very, very good friend who lives in Florida and who's a member of a golf club. And the golf club decided they were going to sponsor an event to a golf course in Missouri. And like 20 members went on this trip and they were all basically together. They they didn't go out. They didn't go other places. Four came back with COVID. One died. And, I, you know, is that is that within the burden of proof, preponderance of the evidence that they likely got COVID on this trip? Yes. I think it's very because they were a self-contained pod at that point. Exactly. And it was a sponsored event by the country club. Now, that's usually we don't have associations, particularly this at this point, doing those kinds of trips. But if you, you know, if you open your clubhouse and you have a bridge playing group and they all come down, the only time they see each other is when they're playing bridge and they all come down with COVID. You know, there may be enough there for a jury to decide, yes, that, that you, there's You know, we, we had that exact uh, scenario down here in an Aventura condominium where it was mm-hmm. early in the pandemic. You know, we're mostly talking about these indoor areas, folks, you know, the gym, uh, the card room, and again, the corridors and the elevator. I think it's important for people to understand we hopefully will not be suffering from a pandemic the rest of our natural lives. I, I mean, I think at some point we are going to be able to manage this thing, get it under control. And just as we did with the SARS virus years ago, declare it over and defeat it. So, the, you know, the use of these measures, these COVID safety protocols, it's important for people to understand this is what needs to be done right now. Things change. We see that in our communities well before this, you know, whether it's redoing the pool so the pool gets closed. 
there certain steps you have to take depending on what's going on around you. So again, this is not the new normal forever. It's just what needs to be done right now to make sure that your association is providing a standard of due care. And you know, you know, Donna, although neither of us are epidemiologists, the fact is that the more we can all do to slow down the spread, the like, less likely more variants start to come into play, some that might be even more infectious than Delta, although that'd be hard to believe, but more more potent, more infectious. And then this will just keep circulating in our society for a long time. So I think, you know, if the pure legal analysis doesn't recommend to people that they be cautious, hopefully not wanting to live with this for the next 10 years will convince people. It's a it's a fair point. You know, you mentioned, David, that your COVID uh, shield law was drafted specifically with associations in mind. And I think that's that's fantastic. I will tell you in Florida, part of the problem and, and part of the confusion was that the emergency orders, the local orders, um, even the COVID shield liability law, nothing really addressed private residential communities directly, which is shocking because we have 60,000 of them in Florida. I mean, it certainly made my phone ring off the hook of, hey, are we a business entity in terms of being able to enjoy immunity uh, from liability? You know, I would hope that on a going forward basis, our public policymakers would think about that and take that into account that you've got these these community associations with elected volunteer board members, how about we draft some of these orders taking into account these folks and make it clearer what does and does not apply to them? Listen, we had exactly the same issue uh, with the constant executive orders. I think between executive order 105 and executive order 250 something, the vast majority of them were on COVID. You would read the language and you could see that the people drafting it did not have private communities in mind at all. And participating on our legislative action committee, we we even had a couple of instances where we had to have our lobbyists go to the governor's office and say, listen, you need to clarify something that you've said because you're causing enormous confusion about whether this applies or does not apply to a community association. And in some instances, they did that. It was helpful. But clearly, we're not prime. Now, in New Jersey, we only have about 7,500 community associations, but we're a much smaller state with a much smaller population. So, you know, so it's still a, so it's still a significant percentage of your state's population are people living in these shared ownership communities. Absolutely. Out of about 9 million New Jerseyans, about one and a half million live in a community association of some sort. How do you overlook, the, you know, the hurdles and the challenges that 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 you have in these communities and you're really expecting volunteer board members to make these incredibly important decisions? So I guess in the future, we're, you know, fingers crossed that this is something um, that in the future we're going to have more of a say. Let's hope so. I would even say between your horizontal condominiums, townhouse style, and mid and high rises, there were even significant differences in how the executive orders might play out. As you say, common hallways, common vestibules, lobbies, etc., does present a whole different level of concern than in a typical townhouse type community. I think, David, you and I both agree that volunteer boards, you're going to need backup if the local orders and the state orders are no longer requiring masks. You need to reach out to your attorney. You need to be following the public health guidance. By the way, not TV news personalities, not uh, clickbait on social media but verifiable experts so you know you're protected. We know most boards want to do the right thing. They want to protect and safeguard their residents. So final question, David, is there any silver lining to be found in what our boards and communities have experienced during this pandemic? Well, I always like to, I I tend to be an optimist at heart, and it's a little hard to find (laughs) the silver lining in this one. But I think if there's anything I would say about a silver lining is it has given us an opportunity to really drill into boards, their duties as a fiduciary, and their role really is important. And and while the pandemic has heightened that, there are many other instances where that duty or those duties come into play. 
And I think even after this is all over, hopefully at least the current board members will remember the advice they got and will still live by it. Well, for me, it's been, again, very hard to find a silver lining in what we've been through and what we continue to, to, to experience. But I think the revelation that technology is not something to fear, it's something to embrace, and it's something that can bring your community together. I mean, I will tell you, David, because of virtual meetings, because of online voting, we've had greater participation during the pandemic, particularly in communities with a significant percentage of out-of-state or international owners than we've ever seen before. So for me, I would think that would be one of the positives that's that's actually emerged that that's a great one and um i totally agree donna that that is uh something we've all learned and we actually see that we can conduct pretty effective meetings thank you so much for joining us today this is an incredibly timely and important topic and thank you for helping to get the word out to our volunteer board members and their management professionals about whether or not they can continue to impose mask mandates well donna thank you for asking me and it's been an absolute pleasure thanks for joining us today Don't forget to follow us on your favorite podcast platform. Leave a review so more people can take it to the board and visit takeittotheboard.com for more information.